I am, I will, I won't feel anything, but if I could, I would feel triumphal at having lived at all and at having lived on this splendid planet and having been given the opportunity to understand something about why I was here in the first place before not being here. Can you understand my quaint English accent? <laughs> like everybody else, I was entranced yesterday by the animal session, uh, Robert Full and Franz Lanting and others, uh, the beauty of the things that they showed. The only slight jarring note was when Jeffrey Katzenberg said of the Mustang, the most splendid creatures that God put on this earth. Now, of course, we know that he didn't really mean that, but in this country at the moment, you can't be too careful. <laughs> I'm a biologist, and the central theorem of our subject, the theory of design, Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, in professional circles everywhere, it's of course universally accepted. In non-professional circles outside America, it's largely ignored. But in, profession, but in non professional circles within America, it arouses so much hostility that it's fair to say that American biologists are in a state of war. The war is so worrying at present, with court cases coming up in one state after another, that I felt I had to say something about it. If you want to know what I have to say about Darwinism itself, I'm afraid you're going to have to look at my books which you won't find in the bookstore outside. <laughs> Contemporary court cases often concern an allegedly new version of creationism called intelligent design, or ID. Don't be fooled. There's nothing new about ID. It's just creationism under another name. Rechristened, I choose the word advisedly, for tactical, political reasons. The arguments of so-called ID theorists are the same old arguments that have been refuted again and again since Darwin down to the present day. There is an effective evolution lobby coordinating the fight on behalf of science, and I try to do all I can to help them, but they get quite upset when people like me dare to mention that we happen to be atheists as well as evolutionists. They see us as rocking the boat you can understand why. Creationists, lacking any coherent scientific argument for their case, fall back on the popular phobia against atheism. Teach your children evolution in biology class, and they'll soon move on to drugs, grand larceny, and sexual preversion. In fact, of course, educated theologians from the Pope down are firm in their support of evolution. This book, Finding Darwin's God by Kenneth Miller, is one of the most effective attacks on intelligent design that I know, and it's all the more effective because it's written by a devout Christian. People like Kenneth Miller could be called a godsend to the evolution lobby <laughs> because they expose the lie that evolutionism is, as a matter of fact, tantamount to atheism. People like me, on the other hand, rock the boat. But here I want to say something nice about creationists. It's not a thing I often do, so listen carefully. <laughs> I think they're right about one thing. I think they're right that evolution is fundamentally hostile to religion. I've already said that many individual evolutionists, like the Pope, are also religious, but I think they're deluding themselves. I believe a true understanding of Darwinism is deeply corrosive to religious faith. Now, it may sound as though I'm about to preach atheism, and I want to reassure you that that's not what I'm going to do. In an audience as sophisticated as that, as, as this one, that would be preaching to the choir. No, what I want to urge upon you, <laughs> instead, what I want to urge upon you is militant atheism. <laughs> but that's putting it too negatively. If I wanted to, if I was a person who was interested in preserving religious faith, I would be very afraid of the positive power 
of evolutionary science, and indeed science generally, but evolution in particular, to inspire and enthrall precisely because it is atheistic. Now, the difficult problem for any theory of biological design is to explain the massive statistical improbability of living things. Statistical improbability in the direction of good design. Complexity is another word for this. The standard creationist argument, there is only one, they all reduced to this one, takes off from statistical improbability. Living creatures are too complex to have come about by chance. Therefore, they must have had a designer. This argument, of course, shoots itself in the foot. Any designer capable of designing something really complex has to be even more complex himself. And that's before we even start on the other things he's expected to do, like forgive sins, bless marriages, listen to prayers, favor our side in a war, <laughs> disapprove of our sex lives, and so on. <laughs> Complexity is the problem that any theory of biology has to solve. And you can't solve it by postulating an agent that is even more complex, thereby simply com compounding the problem. Darwinian natural selection is so stunningly elegant because it solves the problem of explaining complexity in terms of nothing but simplicity. Essentially, it does it by providing a smooth ramp of gradual, step-by-step -step increment. But here I only want to make the point that the elegance of Darwinism is corrosive to religion precisely because it is so elegant, so parsimonious, so powerful, so economically powerful. It has the sinewy economy of a beautiful suspension bridge. The God theory is not just a bad theory. It turns out to be in principle incapable of doing the job required of it. So returning to tactics and the evolution lobby, I want to argue that rocking the boat may be just the right thing to do. My approach to attacking creationism is unlike the evolution lobby, my approach to attacking creationism is to attack religion as a whole. And at this point, I need to acknowledge the remarkable taboo against speaking ill of religion. And I'm going to do so in the words of the late Douglas Adams, a dear friend who, if he never came to TED, certainly should have been invited. He was? He was, good. I thought he must have been. He begins this speech, which was uh, tape recorded in Cambridge shortly before he died. He begins by explaining how science works through the testing of hypotheses that are framed to be vulnerable to disproof. And then he goes on, I quote, religion doesn't seem to work like that. It has certain ideas at the heart of it which we call sacred or holy. What it means is, here is an idea or a notion that you're not allowed to say anything bad about. You're just not. Why not? Because you're not. <laughs> Why should it be that it's perfectly legitimate to support the Republicans or Democrats, this model of economics versus that, versus that, Macintosh instead of Windows, but to have an opinion about how the universe began, about who created the universe, no, that's holy. So we are used to not challenging religious ideas. And it's very interesting how much of a furore Richard creates when he does it. He meant me, not that one. Everybody gets absolutely frantic about it because you're not allowed to say these things. Yet when you look at it rationally, there is no reason why those ideas shouldn't be as open to debate as any other except that we've agreed somehow between us that they shouldn't be. And that's the end of the quote from Douglas. In my view, not only is, is science corrosive to religion, religion is corrosive to science. It teaches people to be satisfied with trivial, supernatural non-explanations and blinds them to the wonderful real explanations that we have within our grasp. It teaches them to accept authority, revelation, and faith, instead of always insisting on evidence. There's Douglas Adams' magnificent picture from his book, Last Chance to See. Now, there's a typical scientific journal, the Quarterly Review of Biology, and I'm going to put together 
uh, a guest editor uh, a, a special issue on the question, did an asteroid kill the dinosaurs? And the first paper is a standard scientific paper pre presenting evidence. Iridium layer at the KT boundary, potassium argon dated crater in Yucatan, indicate that an asteroid killed a dinosaur. Perfectly ordinary scientific paper. Now the next one. The president of the Royal Society has been vouchsafed a strong inner conviction that an asteroid killed the dinosaur. <laughs> It has been privately revealed to Professor Hapstein that an asteroid killed the dinosaur. <laughs> Professor Haldley was brought up to have total and unquestioning faith <laughs> that an asteroid <laughs> killed the dinosaur. <laughs> Professor Hawkins has promulgated an official dogma binding on all loyal Hawkinsians that an asteroid killed the dinosaur. <laughs> That's inconceivable, of course. But suppose... In 1987, a reporter asked George Bush Sr. whether he recognized the equal citizenship and patriotism of Americans who are atheists. Mr. Bush's reply has become infamous. No, I don't know that atheists should be considered citizens, nor should they be considered patriots. This is one nation under God. Bush's bigotry was not an isolated mistake, blurted out in the heat of the moment and later retracted. He stood by it in the face of repeated calls for clarification or withdrawal. He really meant it. More to the point, he knew it posed no threat to his election. Quite the contrary. Democrats, as well as Republicans, parade their religiousness if they want to get elected. Both parties invoke one nation under God. What would Thomas Jefferson have said? Incidentally, I'm not usually very proud of being British, but you can't help making the comparison. <laughs> In practice, what is an atheist? An atheist is just somebody who feels about Yahweh the way any decent Christian feels about Thor or Baal or the golden calf. As has been said before, we are all atheists about most of the gods that humanity has ever believed in. Some of us just go one god further. <laughs> and however we define atheism, it's surely the kind of academic belief that a person is entitled to hold without being vilified as an unpatriotic, unelectable non-citizen. Nevertheless, it's an undeniable fact that to own up to being an atheist is tantamount to introducing yourself as Mr. Hitler or Miss Beelzebub. And that all stems from the perception of atheists as some kind of weird, way-out minority. Natalie Angia wrote a rather sad piece in The New Yorker saying how lonely she felt as an atheist. She clearly feels in a beleaguered minority. But actually, how do American atheists stack up numerically. The latest survey makes surprisingly encouraging reading. Christianity, of course, takes a massive lion's share of the population with nearly 160 million. But what would you think was the second largest group convincingly outnumbering Jews with 2.8 million, Muslims with 1.1 million, Hindus, Buddhists, and all other religions put together? The second largest group with nearly 30 million is the one described as non-religious, or secular. You can't help wondering why vote-seeking politicians are so proverbially overawed by the power of, for example, the Jewish lobby. The state of Israel seems to owe its very existence to the American Jewish vote, while at the same time consigning the non-religious to political oblivion. This secular non-religious vote, if properly mobilized, is nine times as numerous as the Jewish vote. Why does this far more substantial minority not make a move?
to exercise its political muscle. Well, so much for quantity. How about quality? Is there any correlation, positive or negative, between intelligence and tendency to be religious? <laughs> The survey that I quoted, which is the ARIS survey, didn't break down its data by socioeconomic class or education or IQ or anything else. But a recent article by Paul G. Bell in the Mensa magazine provides some straws in the wind. Mensa, as you know, is an international organization for people with very high IQ. And from a meta-analysis of the literature, Bell concludes that, I quote, of 43 studies carried out since 1927 on the relationship between religious belief and one's intelligence or educational level, all but four found an inverse connection. That is, the higher one's intelligence or educational level, the less one is likely to be religious. Well, I haven't seen the original 42 studies and I can't comment on that, that meta-analysis, but I would like to see more studies done along those lines and I know that there are, if I could put a little plug here, there are people in this audience easily capable of financing a massive research survey to settle the question. And I put the suggestion up for what it's worth. But let me now show you some data that has been properly published and analyzed on one special group, namely top scientists. In 1998, Larson and Whittam polled the cream of American scientists those who've been honored by election to the National Academy of Sciences. And among this select group, belief in a personal God dropped to a shattering 7%. About 20% are agnostic, and the rest could fairly be called atheists. The similar figures obtained for belief in personal immortality. Among biological scientists, the figure's even lower. 5.5% uh, only believe in God. In physical scientists, it's 7.5%. I've not seen corresponding figures for elite scholars in other fields, such as history or philosophy, but I'd be surprised if they were different. So we've reached a truly remarkable situation, a grotesque mismatch between the American intelligentsia and the American electorate. A philosophical opinion about the nature of the universe, which is held by the vast majority of top American scientists, and probably the majority of the intelligentsia generally, is so abhorrent to the American electorate that no candidate for popular election dare affirm it in public. If I'm right, this means that high office in the greatest country in the world is barred to the very people best qualified to hold it, the intelligentsia, unless they're prepared to lie about their beliefs. To put it bluntly, American political opportunities are heavily loaded against those who are simultaneously intelligent and honest. I'm not a citizen of this country, so I hope it won't be thought unbecoming if I suggest that something needs to be done. I've already hinted what that something is. From what I've seen of TED, I think this may be the ideal place to launch it. Again, I fear it will cost money. We need a consciousness-raising, coming-out campaign for American atheists. <laughs> this could be similar to the campaign organized by homosexuals a few years ago, although heaven forbid that we should stoop into public outing of people against their will. In most cases, people who out themselves will help to destroy the myth that there is something wrong with atheists. On the contrary, they'll demonstrate that atheists are often the kinds of people who could serve as decent role models for your children, the kinds of people an advertising agent could use to recommend a product, the kinds of people who are sitting in this room. There should be a snowball effect, a positive feedback, such that the more names we, we have, the more we get. There could be non-linearities, threshold effects, when a critical mass has been obtained, there's an abrupt acceleration in recruitment. And again, it will need money. I suspect that the word atheist itself contains or remains a stumbling block, far out of proportion to what it actually means, and a stumbling block to people who otherwise might be happy to out themselves. So what other words might be used to smooth the path, oil the wheels, sugar the pill? 
Darwin himself preferred agnostic, and not only out of loyalty to his friend Huxley, who coined the term. Darwin said, I have never been an atheist in the same sense of denying the existence of a god. I think that generally an agnostic would be the most correct description of my state of mind. He even became uncharacteristically tetchy with Edward Aveling. Aveling was a militant atheist who failed to persuade Darwin to accept the dedication of his book on atheism, incidentally giving rise to a fascinating myth that Karl Marx tried to dedicate Das Kapital to Darwin, which he didn't. It was actually Edward Aveling. What happened was that Aveling's mistress was Marx's daughter. And when both Darwin and Marx were dead, Marx's papers became muddled up with Aveling's papers. And a letter from Darwin saying, my dear sir, thank you very much, but I don't want you to dedicate your book to me, was mistakenly supposed to be addressed to Marx. And that, that gave rise to this whole myth, which you've probably heard, it's sort of urban myth, that the Marx tried to dedicate capital to Darwin. Anyway, it was Aveling, and when they met, Darwin challenged Aveling. Why do you call yourselves atheists? Agnostic, retorted Aveling, was simply atheist writ respectable, and atheist was simply agnostic writ aggressive. Darwin complained, but why should you be so aggressive? Darwin thought that atheism might be well and good for the intelligentsia, but that ordinary people were not, quote, ripe for it. Which is, of course, our old friend, the don't rock the boat argument. It's not recorded whether Aveling told Darwin to come down off his high horse. <laughs> but in any case, that was more than 100 years ago. You think we might have grown up since then. Now, a friend, an intelligent lapsed Jew, who incidentally observes the Sabbath for reasons of cultural solidarity, describes himself as a tooth fairy agnostic. He won't call himself an atheist because it's in principle impossible to uh, prove a negative, but agnostic on its own might suggest that God's existence was therefore on equal terms of likelihood as his non-existence. So my friend is strictly agnostic about the tooth fairy, but it isn't very likely, is it? like God. Hence the phrase tooth fairy agnostic. Bertrand Russell made the same point using a hypothetical teapot in orbit about Mars. You strictly have to be agnostic about whether there is a teapot in orbit about Mars, but that doesn't mean you treat the likelihood of its existence as on all fours with its non-existence. The list of things which we strictly have to be agnostic about doesn't stop at tooth fairies and teapots, it's infinite. If you want to believe one particular one of them, unicorns, or tooth fairies, or teapots, or Yahweh, the onus is on you to say why. The onus is not on the rest of us to say why not. We who are atheists are also a fairyists and a teapotists. <laughs> but we don't bother to say so. And this is why my friend uses a tooth fairy agnostic as a label for what most people would call atheist. Nonetheless, if we want to attract deep down atheists to come out publicly, we're going to have to find something better to stick on our banner than tooth fairy or teapot agnostic. How about humanist? This has the advantage of a worldwide network of well-organized associations and journals and things already in place. My problem with it is only its apparent anthropocentrism. One of the things we've learned from Darwin is that the human species is only one among millions of cousins, some close some distant. And there are other possibilities like naturalist, but that also has problems of confusion because Darwin would have thought naturalist, uh, nat naturalist means of course as opposed to supernaturalist, and it, it, it is used sometimes. Darwin would have been confused by the other sense of naturalist, which he was of course, and I suppose there might be others who would confuse it with, with nudism. Um, such people, such people might those belonging to the British lynch mob, which last year attacked a paediatrician in mistake for a paedophile. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the best of the available alternatives for atheists is simply non-theist. It lacks the strong connotation that there's definitely no God, and it could therefore easily be embraced by teapot or tooth fairy agnostics. It's 
um, completely compatible with the god of the physicists. The, uh, when people like, when, 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 when atheists like Stephen Hawking and Albert Einstein use the word god, they use it, of course, as a metaphorical shorthand for that deep, mysterious part of physics which we don't yet understand. Non-theists will do for all that, uh, yet unlike atheists, it doesn't have the same phobic, uh, hysterical uh, re re responses. But I think, actually, the alternative is to grasp the nettle of the word atheism itself, precisely because it is a taboo word, carrying frissons of hysterical phobia. Critical mass may be harder to achieve with the word atheist than with the word non-theist, or some other non-confrontational word. But if we did achieve it with that dread word, atheist itself, the political impact would be even greater. Now, I said that if I were religious, I'd be very afraid of evolution. I go further. I would fear science in general if properly understood. And this is because the scientific worldview is so much more exciting, more poetic, more filled with sheer wonder than anything in the poverty-stricken arsenals of the religious imagination. As Carl Sagan, another recently dead hero, put it, how is it that hardly any major religion has looked at science and concluded this is better than we thought? The universe is much bigger than our prophets said, grander, more subtle, more elegant. Instead they say, no, 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 my God is a little God and I want him to stay that way. A religion, old or new, that stress the magnificence of the universe as revealed by modern science might be able to draw forth reserves of reverence and awe hardly tapped by the conventional faiths. Mm -hmm. Now, this is an elite audience and I would therefore expect about 10% of you to be religious. <clears throat> Many of you probably subscribe to our polite cultural belief that we should respect religion. But I also suspect that a fair number of those secretly despise religion as much as I do. <laughs> if you're one of them, and of course many of you may not be, but if you are one of them, I'm asking you to stop being polite, come out and say so. And if you happen to be rich, give some thought to ways in which you might make a difference. The religious lobby in this country is massively financed by foundations, say nothing of all the tax benefits, by foundations such as the Templeton Foundation and the Discovery Institute. We need an anti-Templeton to step forward. If my books sold as well as Stephen Hawking's books, instead of only as well as Richard Dawkins's books, I'd do it myself. People are always going on about how did September the 11th change you? Well, here's how it changed me. Let's all stop being so damned respectful. Thank you very much. I am Michael Shermer, the director of the Skeptic Society, the publisher of Skeptic Magazine. We investigate claims of the paranormal, pseudoscience, and fringe groups, and cults, and claims of all kinds between science and pseudoscience and non-science, junk science, voodoo science, pathological science, bad science, non-science, and plain old nonsense. And unless you've been on Mars recently, you know there's a lot of that out there. Some people call us debunkers, 
which is kind of a negative term, but let's face it, there's a lot of bunk. And we are like the bunko squads of the police departments out there flushing out. Well, we're sort of like the Ralph Naders of bad ideas, <laughs> trying to replace bad ideas with good ideas. I'll show you an example of a bad idea. I brought this with me. This was uh, given to us by NBC Dateline to test. It's, the, uh, it's produced by the Quadro Corporation of West Virginia. It's called the Quadro 2000 Dowser Rod. This was being sold to high school administrators for $900 a piece. It's a piece of plastic with a Radio Shack antenna attached to it. You can douse for all sorts of things, but this particular one was built to douse for marijuana in students' lockers. <laughs> so the way it works, is you go down the hallway and you see if it tilts toward a particular locker and then you open the locker. So it looks something like this. I'll show you. So, it, well, it has kind of a right-leaning bias, so I'll show you. Well, this is science, so we'll do a controlled experiment. It'll go this way for sure. <laughs> sir, you want to empty your pockets, please, sir? <laughs> So the question was, can it, can it actually find marijuana in students' lockers? And the answer is, if you open enough of them, yes. <laughs> but in science, we have to keep track of the misses, not just the hits. And that's probably the key lesson to my short talk here is that um, this is how psychics work, astrologers and tarot card readers and so on. People remember the hits, they forget the misses. In science, we have to keep the whole database and look to see if the number of hits is somehow uh, stands out from the total number that you would expect by chance. In this case, we tested it. We had two opaque boxes, one with government-approved THC marijuana and one with nothing, and it got it 50% of the time, <laughs> which is exactly what you'd expect with a coin flip model. So that's just kind of a fun little example here of uh, the sorts of things we do. Skeptic is a quarterly publication. Each one has a particular theme. Like this one is on the future of intelligence. Are people getting smarter or dumber? I have an opinion of this myself because the business I'm in. But in fact, people, it turns out, are getting smarter. Three, three IQ points um, per, per 10 years going up. Sort of an interesting thing. With science, don't think of skepticism as a thing, or even science as a thing. Are science and religion compatible? It's like, is science and plumbing compatible? These, they're just two different things. Science is not a thing. It's a verb. It's a way of thinking about things. It's a way of looking for natural explanations for all phenomena. I mean, what's more likely that that extraterrestrial intelligences or multidimensional beings travel across the vast distances of interstellar space to leave a crop circle in Farmer Bob's Field and Pucker Brush, Kansas to promote Skeptic.com or webpage? Or is it more likely that a reader of Skeptic did this with Photoshop? And in all cases, we have to ask, <laughs> what's the more likely explanation? And before we say something is out of this world, we should first make sure that it's not in this world. What's more likely, that Arnold had a little extraterrestrial help in his run for the governorship, or that the World Weekly News makes stuff up. <laughs> and part of that, the same theme, is expressed nicely here in the Sidney Harris cartoon. For those of you in the back, it says here, then a miracle occurs. I think you need to be more explicit here in step two. This single slide completely dismantles the intelligent design arguments. There's nothing more to it than that. You can say a miracle occurs. It's just that it doesn't explain anything. It doesn't offer anything. There's nothing to test. It's the end of the conversation for intelligent design uh, creationists. Whereas, and, and it's true, scientists sometimes throw terms out as linguistic place fillers, dark energy or dark matter or something like that. Until we figure out what it is, we'll just call it this. It's the beginning of the causal chain for science. For intelligent design creationists, it's the end of the chain. So again, we can ask this, what's more likely? Are UFOs, alien spaceships, or perceptual cognitive mistakes, or even fakes? This is a UFO shot from my house in Altadena, California, uh, looking down over Pasadena. And if it looks a lot like a Buick hubcap, it's because it is. <laughs> uh, you don't even need Photoshop. You don't need high-tech equipment. You don't need computers. This was shot with a uh, throwaway Kodak Instamatic camera. You just have somebody off on the side with a hubcap ready to go, cameras ready, that's it. <laughs> So although it's possible that most of these things are fake or illusions or, or so on, and that some of them are real, it's more likely that all of them are fake, like the crop circles. On a more serious note, in all of science, we're looking for a balance between uh, data and theory. In the case of, of, of Galileo, he had uh, two problems when he turned his telescope to Saturn. Uh, first of all, there was no theory of planetary rings, and second of all, his data was grainy and fuzzy, and he couldn't quite make out what it was he was looking at. So he wrote that he has seen, I have observed 
that the furthest planet has three bodies. And this is what he, he ended up concluding that he saw. So without a theory of planetary rings and with only grainy data, uh, you can't have a good, good theory. And it wasn't solved until 1655. This is Christian Huygens' book in which he cataloged all the mistakes that people made in trying to figure out what was going on with Saturn. It wasn't until Huygens had two things. He had a good theory of planetary rings and how uh, the solar system operated, and then he had better telescopic, more fine-grained data in which he could figure out that as the Earth is going around faster according to Kepler's laws than Saturn, then we catch up with it and we see the angles of the rings at different uh, different angles there, and that's in fact turns out to be true. The, the problems with having a theory is that your theory may be loaded with cognitive biases. So one of the problems with explaining why people believe we're things is that we have things on a simple level, and then I'll go to more serious ones, like um, we have a tendency to see faces. This is the face on Mars, which was uh, in 1976, so there was a whole movement to get NASA to photograph uh, that area because people thought this was monumental architecture made by Martians. Well, it turns out here's the close-up of it from 2001. If you squint, you can still see the face. And when you're squinting, what you're doing is you're turning that from fine grain to coarse grain. And so you're reducing the quality of your data. And if I didn't tell you what to look for, you'd still see the face because we're programmed by evolution to see faces. Faces are important for us socially. And of course, happy faces, faces of all kinds are easy to see. You can see the happy face on Mars there. If astronomers were frogs, perhaps they'd see Kermit the Frog. You see him there, little froggy legs. Or if geologists were elephants. Uh, religious, like, religious iconography. <laughs> discovered by a Tennessee Baker in 1996. He charged five bucks a head to come see the nun bun until he got a, a cease and desist from Mother Teresa's lawyer. <laughs> Here's Our Lady of Guadalupe and Our Lady of Watsonville, just down the street or is it up the street from here. Uh, tree bark is particularly good because it's nice and grainy, branchy, uh, black and white, splotchy, and you can get the pattern-seeking, humans are pattern-seeking animals. Here's the Virgin Mary on the side of a glass window in Sao Paulo. Uh, here's the Virgin Mary made her appearance on a cheese sandwich, which I got to actually hold in the uh, Las Vegas casino, of course, this being America. <laughs> this casino paid $28,500 on eBay for the, for the uh, cheese sandwich. But who does it really look like? The Virgin Mary? It has that sort of puckered lips, uh, 1940s era look. Virgin Mary in Clearwater, Florida. I actually went to see this one. Um, there was a lot of people there of the faithful come to be in their um, wheelchairs and crutches and so on. And uh, we went down and investigated, just to give you a size that's Dawkins, me, and the amazing Randy next to this two, two and a half story size image. All these candles, so many thousands of candles people had lit in tribute to this. So we walked around the backside just to see what was going on here. Where it turns out wherever there's a sprinkler head and a palm tree, you get the effect. Here's the Virgin Mary on the backside which they started to wipe off. I guess you can only have one miracle per building. <laughs> so is it really a miracle of Mary, or is it a miracle of Marge? And, and then I'm gonna finish up with um, another example of this, uh, uh, with audio, uh, uh, auditory illusions. Um, there's this, this film, White Noise, with, with Michael Keaton about the, the dead talking back to us. Uh, by the way, this whole business of talking to the dead, it's not that big a deal. Anybody can do it. Turns out it's getting the dead to talk back. That's the really <laughs> hard part. In this case, um, supposedly uh, these messages are hidden in electronic phenomena. There's a reversespeech.com webpage in which I downloaded this stuff. Here is the forward. This is the most famous one of all of these. Here's the forward version of the very famous song. Oh, can you just listen to that all day? <laughs> all right, here it is backwards, and see if you can hear the hidden messages that are supposedly in there. What'd you get? 
Satan. Okay, well, at least we got Satan. Now I will prime your auditory part of your brain to tell you what you're supposed to hear, and then hear it again. <laughs> Yeah, I can't miss it when I tell you what's there. All right, I'm going to just end with a, a positive, a, a nice little story about the Skeptics is a, a, a nonprofit educational organization. We're always looking for little good things that people do. In England, there's a, a, a pop singer, very one of the top popular singers in England today, Katie Malua, and she wrote a beautiful song. It was in top five uh, for 19, in 2005 uh, called uh, Nine Million Bicycles in Beijing. It's, it's a love story. She's sort of the Nora Jones of, of the UK about how much she loves her guy and compared to nine million bicycles and so forth. And she has this one passage here. We are 12 billion light years from the air. That's again. No one can ever say it's true. But I know that I will always be with you. Well, that's nice. Um, at least you got it close. In America, it would be we're 6,000 light years from the edge. Uh, <laughs> But my friend Simon Singh, the uh, particle physicist, now turned science educator, and he wrote the book The Big Bang and so on, uses every chance he gets to promote good science. And so he wrote an op-ed piece in The Guardian about Katie's song in which he said, well, um, we know exactly how, how old the, how far from the edge, you know, it's 12, it's 13.7 billion light years. And it's not a guess. We know within a precise error bars there uh, how close it is. And so we can say, although not absolutely true, that it's pretty close to being true. And uh, to his credit, Katie called him up after this op-ed piece came out and said, I'm so embarrassed. I was a member of the astronomy club, and I should have known better. And she recut the song, so I will end with the new version. We are 13.7 billion light years from the edge of the observable universe. That's a good estimate. We will find that And with the available information, I predict that I will always be with you. What if great ideas weren't cherished? What if they carried no importance? Or held no value? There is a place where artistic vision is protected, where inspired design ideas live on to become ultimate driving machines. So since I was here last, uh, in 06, uh, we discovered that uh, global climate change is turning out to be a pretty serious issue, so we cover that uh, fairly extensively in Skeptic Magazine. We investigate uh, all kinds of uh, scientific and quasi-scientific controversies, but it turns out we don't really have to worry about any of this because the world's going to end in 2012. Uh, another update, uh, you will recall, uh, I introduced you guys to the Quadro Tracker. It's a... Um, like a water dowsing device. It's just a hollow piece of plastic with an antenna that swivels around and you walk around and it points to things like if you're looking for marijuana in students' lockers, it'll, you know, like point right to some somebody. Oh, sorry. Um, this particular one that was given to me uh, finds golf balls, especially if you're at a golf course and you check under enough bushes. Well, under the category of what's the harm of silly stuff like this, this device, the ADE 651, was sold to the Iraqi government for $40,000 a piece. It's just like this one, completely worthless. 
in which it allegedly worked by electrostatic magnetic ion attraction, which translates to pseudoscientific baloney, would be the nice word, uh, which you string together uh, a bunch of words that sound good, but it does absolutely nothing. In this case, uh, allowing uh, at, tr at uh, trespass points, allowing people to go through because your little tracker device said they were okay, actually cost lives. So there is a danger to pseudoscience and believing in uh, this sort of thing. So what I want to talk about today is belief. I want to believe, and, uh, and you do too, and in fact I think my thesis here is that belief is the natural state of things. It is the default option. We just believe. We believe all sorts of things. Belief is natural. Disbelief, skepticism, science is not natural. It's, it's more difficult. It's uncomfortable to not believe things. So like Fox Mulder on X-Files who wants to believe in UFOs, uh, well, we all do. And the reason for that is because we, are, uh, we have a belief engine in our brains. Essentially, we are pattern-seeking primates. We connect the dots. A is connected to B. B is connected to C. And sometimes A really is connected to B. And that's called association learning. We find patterns. We make those connections, whether it's Pavlov's dog here, uh, associating the sound of the bell with the food and then he salivates to the sound of the bell or whether it's a Skinnerian rat in which he's having an association between his behavior and a reward for it and therefore he repeats the behavior. In fact what Skinner discovered uh, is that if you put a pigeon in a box like this and he has to press one of these two keys and he tries to figure out what the pattern is and you give him a little reward in the hopper box there, if you just randomly assign rewards such that there is no pattern they will figure out any kind of pattern and whatever they were doing just before they got the reward, they repeat that particular pattern. Sometimes it was even spinning around twice counterclockwise, once clockwise, and peck the key twice. Uh, and that's called superstition. And that, I'm afraid, we will always have with us. I call this process patternicity, that is, the tendency to find meaningful patterns in both meaningful and meaningless noise. When we do this process, we make two types of errors. A type one error or false positive. Uh, is believing a pattern is real when it's not. Our second type of error is a false negative. A type two error is not believing a pattern is real when it is. So let's uh, do a thought experiment. You are a hominid three million years ago walking on the plains of Africa. Your name is Lucy, okay. And, uh, and you hear a rustle in the grass. Is it a dangerous predator or is it just the wind. Your next decision could be the most important one of your life. Well, if you think that the rustle in the grass is, is a dangerous predator and it turns out it's just the wind, you've made an error in cognition. You've made a type one error, a false positive. But no harm, you just move away, you're more cautious, you're more vigilant. On the other hand, if you believe that the rustle in the grass is just the wind and it turns out it's a dangerous predator, you're lunch. You've just won a Darwin Award. You've been taken out of the gene pool. Now the problem here is that patternicities will occur whenever the cost of making a type 1 error is less than the cost of making a type 2 error. This is the only equation in the talk, by the way. We have a pattern detection problem that is assessing the difference between a type 1 and a type 2 error is highly problematic, especially in split-second life and death situations. So the default position is just believe all patterns are real. All rustles in the grass are dangerous predators and not just the wind. And so I think that we evolved. There was a natural selection for the propensity for our belief engines, our pattern-seeking brain processes to always find meaningful patterns and infuse them with these sort of predatory or intentional agencies that I'll come back to. So, for example, what do you see here? It's a horse head. That's right. It looks like a horse. Must be a horse. That's a pattern. And is it really a horse or is it more like a frog? See, our pattern detection device, which is appears to be located in the uh, anterior cingulate cortex, it's our little sort of detection device there, can be easily fooled and this is the problem. For example, what do you see here? Yes, of course, it's a cow. Once I prime the brain, it's called cognitive priming, once I prime the brain to see it, it pops back out again even without the pattern that I've imposed on it. And what do you see here? Some people see a Dalmatian dog. Yes, there it is. And there's the prime, so when I go back, Without the prime, your brain already has the model, so you can see it again. What do you see here? Planet Saturn, yes, that's good. How about here? Just shout out anything you see. 
That's a good audience, Chris, because there's nothing in this. Well, allegedly, there's nothing. <laughs> this is an experiment done by Jennifer Whitson at, um, at uh, UT Austin on uh, corporate environments and whether uncertain uh, feelings of uncertainty and out of control makes people see illusory patterns. That is, almost everybody sees the planet Saturn. People that are put in a condition of out feeling out of control are more likely to see something in this, which is allegedly patternless. Uh, in other words, the propensity to feel these or find these patterns goes up when there's a lack of control. For example, baseball players are notoriously superstitious when they're batting, but not so much when they're fielding. Because fielders are successful 90 to 95 percent of the time. The best batters fail seven out of ten times. So their superstitions, their patternicities are all associated with feelings of lack of control uh, and, and so forth. What do you see in this particular one here? In this feel anybody see a object there there actually is something here but it's degraded while you're thinking about that uh, this was an experiment done by Susan Blackmore a psychologist in England who showed subjects this degraded image and then ran a correlation between their scores on an ESP test how much do they believe in the paranormal supernatural angels and, and so forth and those who scored high on the ESP scale tended to see not only see more patterns in the degraded images but incorrect patterns. Here is what uh, you show subjects the fish degraded 20%, uh, 50%, and then the one I showed you 70%. A similar experiment was done by another British psychologist named Peter Breuger, who found significantly more patterns, meaningful patterns, are received, uh, perceived on the right hemisphere via the left visual field than the left hemisphere. So if you present subjects the images such that it's going to end up on the right hemisphere instead of the left, then they're more likely to see patterns than if you put it on the, the left hemisphere. Our right hemisphere appears to be where a lot of this patternicity occurs. So what we're trying to do is bore into the brain to see where all this happens. Breuger and his colleague Christine Moore gave subjects L-DOPA. L-DOPA is a drug, as you know, given for treating Parkinson's disease, which is related to a, a decrease in dopamine. L-DOPA increases dopamine. An increase in dopamine caused subjects to see more patterns than those that did not receive the dopamine. So dopamine appears to be the drug associated with patternicity. In fact, neuroleptic drugs that are used to eliminate psychotic behavior, things like paranoia, delusions, and hallucinations, these are patternicities. They're incorrect patterns. They're false positives. They're type 1 errors. And if you give them drugs that are a dopamine antagonist, they go away. That is, you decrease the amount of dopamine and their tendency to, to see uh, patterns like that uh, decreases. On the other hand, amphetamines like in cocaine are dopamine agonists. They increase the amount of dopamine. So you're more likely to be uh, feel in a euphoric state, creativity, find more patterns. In fact, I saw Robin Williams recently talk about how he, uh, he was, thought he was much funnier when he was doing cocaine when he had that issue than, than now. So perhaps more dopamine is related to more creativity. Dopamine, I think, changes our signal to noise ratio. That is, how accurate we are in finding patterns. If it's too low, you're more likely to make too many type 2 errors. You miss the real patterns. You don't want to be too skeptical. If you're too skeptical, you'll miss the really interesting good ideas. Just right, you're creative, and yet you don't fall for too much baloney. Too high, and maybe you see patterns everywhere. Every time somebody looks at you, you think people are staring at you, you think people are talking about you, and if you go too far on that, that's just simply labeled as madness. It's a distinction perhaps we might make between two Nobel laureates, Richard Feynman and John Nash. One sees maybe just the right number of patterns to win a Nobel Prize. The other one also, but maybe too many patterns, and we then call that schizophrenia. So the signal-to-noise ratio uh, then presents us with a pattern detection problem. And of course, you all know exactly what this is, right? And what pattern do you see here? Again, I'm putting your anterior cingulate cortex to the test here, causing you conflicting pattern detections. You know, of course, this is via Uno shoes. These are sandals. <laughs> Pretty sexy feet, I must say. <laughs> Maybe a little Photoshop. And of course, the ambiguous figures that seem to flip-flop back and forth. Turns out what you're thinking about a lot influences what you um, tend to see. And, and, and you see the lamp here, I know, because we have lights on here. Of course, thanks to the environmentalist movement, we're all sensitive to the plight of marine mammals. So what you see in this and this particular ambiguous figure is, of course, the dolphins, right? You see a dolphin here, 
and, and, and there's a dolphin, and there's a dolphin. This is a dolphin. That's a dolphin tail there, guys. Um, if, if we can uh, give you conflicting data, again, your ACC is going to be going into hyperdrive. If you look down here, it's fine. If you look up here, then you get conflicting data, and then we have to flip the image for you to see that it's a setup. The impossible crate illusion, it's easy to fool the brain in 2D. So you say, oh, come on, Shermer, anybody can do that in a Psych 101 text with an illusion like that. Well, here's the late, great Jerry Andrus's impossible crate illusion in 3D, in which Jerry is standing inside the impossible crate. And uh, he was uh, kind enough to post this and give us the reveal. Of course, camera angle is everything. The photographer is over there, and this board appears to overlap with this one, and this one is that one, and so on. But even when I take it away, the illusion is so powerful because of how our brains are wired to find those certain kinds of patterns. This is a fairly new one that throws us off because of the conflicting patterns of comparing this angle with that angle. In fact, it's the exact same picture side by side. So what you're doing is comparing that angle instead of with this one, but with that one, and so your brain is fooled. Yet again, your pattern detection devices are fooled. Faces are easy to see because we have an additional evolved facial recognition software in our uh, temporal lobes. Here are some faces on the side of a rock. I'm actually not even sure if this is, this might be Photoshop, but anyway, the point is still made. Uh, which one of these looks odd to you? And a quick reaction, which one looks odd? The one on the left. Okay, I'll rotate it so it'll be the one on the right, and you are correct. Fairly famous illusion that was first done with Margaret Thatcher. Now they, they trade up to politicians every time. Well, why is this happening? Well, we know exactly where it happens in the temporal lobe, right across the sort of above your ear there, in a little structure called the fusiform gyrus. And there's two types of cells that do this, that record facial features, either globally or specifically these large rapid firing cells. First, look at the general face, so you recognize Obama immediately. And then you notice something quite a little bit odd about the eyes and the mouth especially when they're upside down, you're engaging that general facial recognition software there. Now, I said back in our little um, thought experiment, you're a hominid walking on the plains of Africa. Is it just the wind or a dangerous predator? What's the difference between those? Well, a wind is inanimate. The dangerous predator is an intentional agent. And I call this process agenticity. That is the tendency to infuse patterns with meaning, intention, and agency, often invisible beings from the top down. This is an idea that we got from a fellow tester here, uh, Dan Dennett, who talked about taking the intentional stance. So it's a type of that expanded to explain, I think, a lot of different things. Souls, spirits, ghosts, gods, demons, angels, aliens, intelligent designers, government conspiracists, and all manner of invisible agents with power and intention are believed to haunt our world and control our lives. I think it's the basis of animism and polytheism and monotheism. It's the belief that aliens are somehow more advanced than us, more moral than us, and the narratives always are that they're coming here to save us and rescue us uh, from on high. The intelligent designer is always portrayed as this super intelligent moral being that comes down to design life. Even the idea that government can rescue us, that's no longer the wave of the future. But that is, I think, a type of agenticity. The projecting somebody up there, big and powerful, will come rescue us. And this is also, I think, the basis of...